And this is pyoderma gangrenosum, sometimes abbreviated as PG. Now it's important to remember that unfortunately abbreviations are a real problem in medicine because they're even in the field of dermatology, there are two diseases abbreviated as PG. The other one is pyogenic granuloma, also known as lobular capillary hemangioma. And it's gonna be a little ulcerated red nodule that's fleshy and that's made of a lot of blood vessels, totally unrelated the pyoderma gangrenosum. So just to point that out, and I, I still have to catch myself even after eight years in practice as a dermatopathologist, it, sometimes I, I get tripped up over the words and I have to stop and think before I say it to make sure I say pyoderma gangrenosum when I'm talking about this disease. Okay, maybe I'm the only one that has that problem, but if you're out there and have that problem, you're, you're in company with me at least. Here's the high yield points. It's technically classified as a neutrophilic dermatosis because neutrophils kind of drive the process. And what happens is the patients get these rapidly progressing ulcers that can be very severe, very disfiguring and terrible. Sometimes they can go away and then come back later. They can really be a long-term, real problematic disease. 50% or so of the patients have an underlying systemic disorder of some sort that is going on and the pyoderma gangrenosum is happening as a kind of secondary phenomenon to their internal systemic disorder. The most common one is inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, okay? The reason that PG is so important to understand is that it is very commonly misdiagnosed clinically and when it is, it can have devastating results. These often look like chronic ulcers, uh, sometimes they get mistaken for necrotizing fasciitis and there's an attempt to surgically debreed them. The bad news is, is that if, when you do surgery on these ulcers, they have a tendency to recur with even more vengeance than before. They get worse. And that's called the pathergy effect, where trauma, including surgical manipulation, can lead the process to break down the skin even more and expand the ulcerations. And it's really terrible. So that's why it's important to recognize this and try to get a diagnosis when we can because it can help spare the patient from getting surgical debridement, which could be disastrous, okay? And one thing I'll point out here is it's so important to make sure an actual dermatologist sees the patient. And I'm not saying that because I don't have respect for my general surgery colleagues or anyone else, but this is an uncommon disease and it's not on many people's radar, but dermatologists have seen it and they recognize that it has several clues clinically. And I feel like dermatologists often will walk in the room and see the ulcer and say, oh, this looks classic for pyoderma gangrenosum. They get a good feel for what it looks like and they can really help in sorting out things, especially if the patient's being covered by the general surgery service. Sometimes I'll, I'll tell the surgeons, hey, this could be really helpful to have a derm see this patient too, and then work together as a team to figure it out. Because again, the difference is neck fascia, they're gonna do surgical debridement and they're gonna give antibiotics. And for pyoderma, they're gonna actually do the opposite. They're gonna not do surgery and they're gonna give steroids or some other immunosuppressing drug, which is the last thing you'd wanna do if it was an infection. So this is why it's a real problem. Unfortunately, it's also a problem for the, us as pathologists. Classically, the way it's described is that you'll have a sheet of neutrophils filling the dermis under the ulcer. But in reality, in my experience and in some published studies, many of the cases will actually show just nonspecific ulcer changes without very many neutrophils. It depends a lot on the age of the, the lesion. And in my practice, many times once the patient comes in and gets biopsied, they are coming in because they've had a chronic non-healing ulcer. So the ulcer's been there for a while, okay? And so I find that oftentimes these long-standing ulcers, they really don't have much of the neutrophils anymore and they look just like a lot of other chronic non-specific ulcers. The main thing is that infection needs to be excluded either both, either by special stains pathologically, by um, culture clinically, or a variety of those. And once infection has been excluded as best we can, if they, the dermatologist thinks it's PG, then the next step would be to give the patient a trial of immunosuppressive therapy and follow them very closely. And in cases where we can't figure it out for sure, that's what I usually recommend to my clinical team is do everything we can to rule out infection and then give them steroids, systemic steroids or something else and watch them really closely. If it starts getting better, that's a good sign. If it gets worse, then biopsy it again and check it again for infection. All right, here's what it looks like. Um, clinically. You get these ulcers. Sometimes they kind of have this, I think, fenestrated appearance is the word that some people use. It's kind of multiple punched out holes that start to connect together. They often have the rolled kind of undermined border. And I'll show you what that means uh, under the microscope in a minute. Uh, and I've also seen some cases that had surface colonization by fungus or bacteria on the very top 
layer of fibrin, but none down in the dermis. And it's important to recognize a layer of fungus or bacteria on the very top of a chronic ulcer doesn't necessarily mean that fungus or bacteria are causing the ulcer. In fact, if I only see it up at the very surface and not in the dermis at all, that makes me think probably it's not infectious. There may still be some role for antimicrobial therapy there um, to make sure, that, but I kind of think of it as colonization. You know, you've got an ulcer like this covered in fiber and guess what, fungus, bacteria, everything's gonna love to grow on that. So I've seen that a few times actually in cases of pyoderma gangrenosum that had secondary colonization with microorganisms on the very top, but not in the dermis or subcutis. Microscopically, here's an example from our paper of the classic neutrophil rich pattern that you're supposed to see, okay? But I can tell you what, I had to search through my files to find just one good example of that. Most of the cases that we've seen that clinically looked and behaved just like pyoderma gangrenosum did not have this pattern at the point where I saw their biopsy. But here's what the classic is. Tons of neutrophils fooling the dermis, looks like an abscess, right? And that's why you have to exclude infection. When you see this, you do gram stain and PAS, GMS, maybe fight stain even to rule out um, AFB. Um, the neutrophils are here underneath the ulcer, but if you biopsy the edge of the ulcer, which I highly recommend when, they're, when there's a clinical concern for pyoderma gangrenosum, the biopsy ideally should be a wedge or an ellipse, but if it can't be, then a big punch that uh, encompasses the edge, the border of the ulcer, to show me part of the ulcer and part of the edge. Now that's a little different than what I would want in say angioinvasive fungus or thrombotic vasculopathy. I want them to give me a biopsy right from the middle, from the ugliest, most necrotic area, because that's where I'm most likely to find you know, calcification, thrombi, angioinvasive fungus. Here, I don't wanna see that, I wanna see the edge, okay? So I can see if the neutrophils or the, the ulcer uh, contents undermine, that means they go under the epidermis adjacent to the ulcer, that undermining is what gives the kind of rolled border appearance clinically, and it's a very characteristic feature of pyoderma gangrenosum, and so I find that it can be helpful to find this undermining effect of where the infiltrate goes out to the edge under the normal epidermis adjacent to the ulcer. So if I just have a biopsy from the middle of the ulcer, it's not going to tell me very much usually. Now, here's a great example a great example for us to learn from, but unfortunately really bad for the patient. In this case, this patient's surgeon thought that this was an ulcer that needed debrided, but it turns out that once there was more investigation, the patient had inflammatory bowel disease, and this was classic clinically for pyoderma gangrenosum. The surgeon just wasn't familiar with the disease in that case, and this was sent to me long ago as a consult, and I never found out whether the patient had pathogy effect, but this big excision was done as a debridement. But why it's helpful for us here for learning today is two things. Number one, you can beautifully see the rolled border and the undermining at the edge of the ulcer border. That's number one. And number two, look in here, we have edema, reactive vessels, inflammation, and a thick fibrin, uh, you know, a layer of fibrin crust on the surface of the ulcer. But let's go down for a closer look. Not too many neutrophils there are there. I mean, this looks like granulation tissue. You could see this in, in, in any old ulcer that's been around or, or in a biopsy site or a post-surgical changes, you could see this reactive granulation tissue look anywhere. Yeah, there may be a few scattered neutrophils here, but there were other areas from this case that just had none really. The more prominent inflammatory cells in this case actually are plasma cells and lymphocytes. But again, clinically, this person had classic features of pyoderma gangrenosum and had a known history of inflammatory bowel disease, which, you know, all of that fits together perfectly for this being PG. Um, but so this is a great example to me because it was a case that was as good as you could get confirmed clinically PG and it didn't have very many neutrophils. So it's a good take home lesson. So as a pathologist, how do you deal with this when you get one of these specimens and the derm team wants to know if it's PG or not, and it doesn't have specific features of PG. So here's what I say in these cases. I say ulcer with granulation tissue, and I put that there's no classic features of PG, i.e. sheets of neutrophils, but I mentioned that some cases of PG can be nonspecific and look just like a regular um, ulcer. And um, if they, now here I didn't say this comment, obviously, because this was obvious PG, but if they haven't given me the edge of the ulcer, I'll tell them that they should follow the patient and then repeat a biopsy to get the border of the ulcer, and that might be helpful. Uh, but unfortunately, these are these chronic ulcers are a real frustration for everyone, okay? They're a frustration for the patient because it's miserable to have a big non-healing ulcer on your body. It's a terrible thing to go through. You know, I had a chronic infection of my thumbnail, a perinichia. This is a too much information time now where I'm going to tell you my medical history. 
just this tiny little ulcerated thing. It was painful, it was draining, it was miserable. And I thought, gosh, this is this tiny thing. And there are people out there who have these huge non-healing ulcers, that must be a real problem. And, and I actually ended up having part of my thumbnail removed by one of my dermatology colleagues and it fixed the problem. And if you want, you can go watch a video of that, my thumbnail getting removed. It's pretty disturbing, I'll warn you now. It's on my YouTube channel. So um, I, I'll use my own health to teach other people too. If I'm gonna use my cases, I better use my own uh, too. So in any case, um, I can't remember my point before that digression. Oh yeah, this is a terrible problem because people with chronic ulcers are miserable. The dermatologists and the surgeons and the treating doctors, they're frustrated because they're trying everything to fix this and they can't get the ulcer to heal. And then we as pathologists are frustrated because what we're seeing under the microscope is, yeah, it's non-healing ulcer. But sometimes by just looking at the biopsy of the ulcer and saying, no, there's no infection that I can see in this biopsy. Um, there's no angioinvasive fungus, there's no thrombotic vasculopathy. By ruling out some of those other causes of ulcer or, or squamous cell carcinoma sometimes causes chronic ulcers. To be able to say, no, there's no tumor, no, there's, there's no um, occlusive vascular thrombotic changes, no, I don't see granulomas I, and the bug stains, the infectious stains are normal. That can sometimes help by ruling out those other causes and help the team get closer to making a diagnosis. So, so even when you sign it out that way, it's not very satisfying for us as a pathologist, but know that you, you are playing a role in helping uh, get the team closer, hopefully to solving the problem for the patient. But I have to admit, when I see these biopsies, I'm like, oh man, because I know that likely I'm not gonna be able to offer them a ton of useful information. So if you struggle with them, so do I.